traditional owner there. I think this is a really important one from, from our point of view and I think it really sums up both the IPA program and also the Indigenous Rangers program that what we are talking about is partnerships. Partnerships but on our, on, on our terms. Um, the, the, the people in uniform there are uh, talking with uh, Rod Mason, Uncle Rod, who is a traditional owner from, from uh, not, not from our country, but he comes down and helps us with our burning program. Um, the Department of Environment, the firefighters, uh, they, they were doing a bit of learning about cultural burning, about cool burning. And in the background there were our, some of our budge bim rangers. So it was a two-way learning. Um, it took us a couple of years for for uh, the, the, the Department of Environment to understand our requirements. Initially, they wanted to have a, a bulldozer and a, and a large tanker and everything on standby in case a, a small-scale fire got away. Uh, this fire, two years later, they, they sent two crew and two small tankers just on the back of a, a small four-wheel drive. So it took us a couple of years, but we actually, between each other, we, we worked out uh, the, the processes. Um, but it is important that we have the support of those state agencies, Parks Victoria as well, um, it, it is extremely important. But again, I, I reiterate that it's on our terms. Uh, just a, a few other images. Uh, just very briefly and for me to finish up, um, you know, in 1984, the, all the only access we had as traditional owners was to about two hectares of land at the local cemetery. Over the years, we've had uh, high court cases, we've had native title, we've had land acquisitions, and we've uh, extended our, our country to access to country to about 3,000 hectares. And that pale green colour in there is the Budge Bim National Park, and we have co-management of that as well. So we, we've gone in, in 34, 35 years to, from, from two hectares to around about 10,000 10, hectares of land. It's not large by large in scale in, in terms of uh, Australia nor Canada in, in some areas, but it's very important country. All our properties are Indigenous protected areas, um, so we, do, we manage them for the protection of their natural and cultural values. And this is an important slide. What's most important is, is that our mob, we have a cultural responsibility to country, but we also have to be able to enjoy country. And we've got that land back, we need to get our our mob uh, out on country uh, and, and uh, ensure that we, we are improving country. There, yeah, that's it from me. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, g'day, everyone. I'm Aaron Morgan. Um, Gun um, 23 years of age, and I'm just very blessed to have the opportunity to come over here and present to you today. So um, I'll start off with a little, little slide I had together. Um, just talk about the range of workload. So, um, you know, uh, this just explains a bit about the Gunajamara country, first of all. So Gunajamara country is bordered by three rivers, as you can see. The Glenelg River over on the western side. To the north, we've got the Wanna River and the Hopkins River over on the eastern side. Um, so within them, you know, traditional boundaries, there was about 57 clan groups or mobs or family groups. Um, but where I specialise is, you know, the budge beam lava flow. There's that little shaded area in the middle. So budge beam, give a little introduction to him. He is one of our creator beings. Um, I'll just find my notes here. Okay, so 30,000 years ago, you know, he erupted. He was a volcano, I should add. Um, you know, blew his top. He spewed his teeth and his blood all over the landscape you know, and recreated the rivers and the streams and lakes. Um, you know, when that lava solidified, it turned into the volcanic rock that we you know, found very resourceful. It was our housing. You know, it was our, um, our way to catch our feeds. And it was you know, our shelter also from the colonisers. Um, so yeah, that, the volcanic rock was you know, used to build our houses, and I'll talk about that later. Oh, there's a video that I think has a bit about our houses in it, but um, I'll just go to the next slide. Talk about the range of works. So weed control, um, we do a lot of weed control. So weeds of national significance are the, are the ones we're trying to target, really. 
Um, we realise that we cannot, um, I suppose, attack and kill all the weeds. So we're just really trying to contain it and make sure they don't outbreak and, um, I suppose, you know, mess more with the Indigenous protected area landscapes. Um, so weed control, uh, we try to keep on top of if we can, but you know, sometimes we can't. We let it go for a bit and then it's a lot of work on us. So pest control is the same thing. You know, um, you know, we face a lot of problems with rabbits, foxes, deer, cats, and just recently now, um, feral pigs are getting around and tearing up all, you know, all the ground and all the rocks and that. So, um, and they're getting pretty close to some culturally um, sensitive areas. So we want to get to, you know, controlling them before they get to you know, um, and destroy these cultural sites. So culture of burning, so there's a little bit about that um, Uncle Dennis talked about. Uh, like I said, Uncle Rod Mason, respected elder in another mob, he come down and helped us with our, you know, our culture burning because you know, a lot of that was lost due to, you know, a, lot of, a lot of that knowledge was lost due to colonisation. So um, you know, we just needed a little bit of help, you know, guided in the right direction. And that's what Uncle Rod was down for, and you know he did help us. And like Uncle Dennis said, we've been, um, I suppose, um, getting better at our fire program over the last couple of years. Um, oh, lots of fencing. If you can see the sort of landscape, um, you know, behind these boys here, it's very rocky. So fencing is very hard to do. A lot of, a lot of patience, and a lot of walking, a lot of rolling your ankles. It was very rocky. Um, but yeah, we do do lots of fences. We need boundary fences, and um, it's also just a lot of training for the rangers. So the rangers, um, you know, take on all this training to sort of, you know, get them ready for the next sort of their next step in life. So the rangers' job is pretty much um, they target the youth out of school um, that may, you know may, might have dropped out. So that was like me in my case. I was 17 when I became a ranger, and um, you know didn't know nothing really, and then I sort of just worked my way up in the ranger sort of positions and ended up as senior ranger today. Um, so there are a lot of young kids, you know, on the ranger team, you know, gaining all these qualifications and certificates to, um, I suppose, you know, for later on in life when they're ready to do so. This is another photo. So I do a lot of track maintenance. As you can see, we just... We're laying gravel over a barrel. What we're trying to do, we're trying to get the, the gravel over the barrel so it falls into the wheel ruts. So this is a track we're trying to make through a swamp. This property that we've got here, one of the IPAs, is you know, pretty much built on, or not built, I suppose. Um, it's really pretty much on a swamp. So it floods for about two months every year and we lose access. So we're just trying to give the tracks a bit of maintenance just so we can you know, gain access a bit a few more months of the year. Um, so tours, so we run a lot of cultural tours. There's about four or five destinations. Um, we run the tours on the properties that have, you know, eel traps and um, oh, what, stone houses and that. So our worms or, you know, our houses are pretty much, you know, stone villages. The foundations of them were made out of the basalt and scoria rock, so the volcanic rock. And you find the foundations, they sort of look like horseshoes or or um, U-shapes in the ground with rocks. And that's where, you know, um, the ancestors, you know, once inhabited the area. So, so the houses, I suppose, they're built up about a metre in a horseshoe shape. And then, you know, longer sticks are sort of bent from one side to the other to hold it in shape. And once you get sort of a dome sort of shape, you, are, um, you cover it with mud and clay mix. Um, there's a lot more to the process, but as you can hear, I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm just <laughs> rushing through it a little bit, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, the rangers go through a lot of training, as I said, to help, um, I suppose, gain experience for all the young ones growing up. Um, so the main sort of course we go through is our conservation and land management, and that um, you know, runs through... We do that through one of the universities around Melbourne. Um, so we do our Cert 3s and our Cert 4s. 
I've also completed my Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Management course in Cert 4, but um, all the other rangers also go through their, their chemical user permits, all their tractor and plan operations, um, driver's licence also, um, the job helps out with that, and then you know, lots of other tickets that I forgot to write down. Um, the rangers... Oh, that's us riding the boat. We do a bit of cattle operations too, so um, some of our properties that don't have, you know, too much cultural um, heritage or cultural sensitive areas, we run cattle on, on the bigger properties too also. It's just to, again, maintain, maintain the, um, the grass levels a bit lower, I suppose. Um, you know, because it's too big and too rocky for us to cut with mowers and that. Um, so this is a photo of a brogger. So we've recently, in the, over the last 10 years, the broggers have just started coming back to, you know, Gunjumara country and, and the areas, so which is very special. Um, you know, you're always, always very happy to see them. It's one of my totems, so in Koran, the brogger. Um, I'm pretty much, I think this is pretty much it for the presentation. There's a, about an eight minute video, I think, that'll come up next. And it sort of just um, talks, you know, talking actually. It just shows you a little bit more about, you know, the workloads of the budget bin ranges. So I'll let that play as soon as we're ready. And thank you. Touches your heart. Look for me in your memory in the wind or oh, in your arms. Look for me. Look for me.
uh, I was given a list of questions, so I'll pick one. That's not there. <laughs> yeah, what I'm interested in is, is governance. Governance over traditional lands. And that you have 70 indigenous protected areas. What advice would you give to the premier sitting here? And say the prime minister who may be listening. What advice would you give to these uh, leaders of, uh, of Canada in terms of governance <coughs> of indigenous protected areas? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, look, I, I think my, my advice is that uh, have the confidence that the, uh, uh, the, the indigenous people, the uh, First Nations people, I should say, uh, have, have the capacity to do a lot of this. Certainly the commitment uh, is there and I'm sure the capacity is. Um, make sure you do it on their terms. I think that it, it, if, if the government tries to impose, I know it would have happened with us with the Indigenous Protected Areas Program, if the government tried to impose its will on there, the, the barriers would have went up for sure. And it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked to the degree that it has today. Um, but I know that 20 years ago, the state government, uh, national parks agencies, they were very reluctant to support the program. Uh, they seen themselves as the only land managers uh, on country and uh, didn't, didn't recognise that, uh, that, that Indigenous communities uh, could manage uh, country. Um, I think that we've shown that over the years and that's why I pointed out that uh, one with the cultural burning photo that, look, we all learn from each other. If we take it step by step, if, if there's enough resources to be put in, again, I think everyone recognises that 25 million is a, is a drop in the, in, in the bucket compared with what's required, but adequate long-term resourcing uh, funding contracts, we have funding contracts for five years at a time, um, that's, that's okay, it could be better, but we'll, I'd, I'd take that any day. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's just supporting the traditional owners, the First Nations people to, to, to carry out their aspirations, because their aspirations really will coincide with the aspirations of, 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 of the biodiversity requirements and the cultural heritage requirements of country. So, uh, it, Please, it, 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 it won't work any other way. We, we, we see that in Australia. Sure. Sorry, my voice is going a bit. And, and <clears throat> if I could just say one thing, I'm sorry, at the beginning I forgot to acknowledge the wonderfully warm welcome to country that we got and that ceremony this morning. It was, it was fantastic. So my apologies for, for getting that to the start of my speech. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, helping us moderate Ovid. We'd like to say thank you to the gents for, for your fabulous presentation. If you have a chance to have a talk with them over a coffee or something, I would encourage you to do so. It's a pleasure to see that wonderful work going on. They'll be around tomorrow as well. And uh, no, I won't say that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, it gives me a great pleasure and it is an honor to welcome, I don't know what number premier you are, Mr. Premier, but whichever number you are, I think you're getting to be our favorite one. <laughs> We'd like to welcome Premier Horgan to the podium to say a few words to you. Well, uh, thank you for that. I, I think I'm number 36, uh, if anyone was keep keeping count, and I know I am. But uh, it is really an honor to be here on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And it's been a really exciting day for me 
I uh, studied in Australia for a number of years in the 1980s, so I know very much about what uh, Dennis and Aaron were speaking. And I also had the good fortune of meeting Miles and Gujao when they would come and tell Jim Fulton how to make sure that Gwai Hanas got done right uh, in, in the right way in the 1980s. And, and I've had the opportunity since then to, uh, to take the learnings that I've seen and the people that I've talked to in, in nations all around. Well, Dave Porter is another example of someone who taught me how to do things back in the 1990s. So as I become older, I'd like to think I've become wiser. And I firmly believe that we are, as individuals, the amalgam of all of the people and, and actions that come across our path as we go through this journey of life. And it is such a thrill to have the opportunity to make a real significant difference when it comes to reconciliation here in British Columbia and hopefully right across Canada. But I have to say, Anne-Marie, Anne uh, although I'm the 36th Premier, I've never been called Boss Beaver, and I'm pretty excited about that. So <laughs> if Anne-Marie is still here, I lift my hands to you. Thank you so much for that. Um, but it is... Uh, I want to just to give, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I want to give one example of where in the short time we've had as government, we've been able to make a significant difference. And it, it passed without much notice in the broader community. And I'm hopeful that it won't come as a surprise to anyone in this room. But last year, we sat down with uh, Chief Bob Chamberlain and said, how do we find a way forward when it comes to salmon aquaculture in the Broughton Archipelago? I went to the big house in Alert Bay, and I heard from hereditary and, 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 and other indigenous leaders about their concerns about wild salmon. I heard absolutely without any doubt that there were significant challenges in this, not just uh, a food fishery. Salmon are iconic to all British Columbians, but to indigenous people, they're more than food, they're culture, they're everything. They are the land, they are the animals, and we need to do something about it together, was what I heard. Uh, from the leadership. And so we sat down deliberately nation to nation with Bob and other leaders in the Broughton and came up with a path forward. And last December we announced uh, the elimination of uh, fish farms and the migratory routes of the sockeye and the pinks and the chum in the Broughton and a plan for further development should it be the wish of the people who have lived in the Broughton for millennia. That is government-to-government -government discussion. That is putting in place guardians as we rebuild and reestablish, we re rebuild and reestablish the wild salmon runs by making sure that there are local guardians to protect, preserve, and bring back the rivers and streams that have been vacant of salmon for so many, many years now. That's a sim there you go, Dave, have it up for that. It's a real and practical symbol of genuine reconciliation, about taking an issue that was profoundly important, not just to the people of the Broughton, but to all British Columbians, and doing it nation to nation in a respectful way, not to, as, as Dennis said, I don't know where you went to, Dennis, when you moved away from here. As Dennis said, genuine reconciliation is about doing something with each other, not doing something to each other. And it's my hope that in the time we have available, as a government, we are a minority government, it's ne people need to remember that because I oftentimes forget it at my peril. And we need to make sure that every day that we have to make progress, we do make progress. And so being here today to hear the presentations, to reacquaint myself with, uh, with many names and friends that I haven't seen in a good while, lifts my heart and gives me confidence that together we can address the challenges that we face, but we have to do it nation to nation, respectfully, mindful of the past that brought us here, and hopeful about the future we can make together. So I lift my hands, thank you for having me here. I look forward to the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Number 36, Premier of British Columbia. <laughs> this brings us to the end of our program today. Come back here at 6.30 and we will have dinner and then we'll all be hitting the dance floor with Dave, listening to Buffy, Cashton, and Bitterly Divine. All the Indians in the house are gonna be dancing tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Come back here tomorrow morning at seven, but see you at dinner at 6.30. Thank you.